Hi everybody, my name is Matteo, as Silvia said. I am a designer, first of all, and also researcher at the Free University of Bolzano, that is a small town close to the Austrian border, but it's still in Italy. And s some years ago, I started uh, researching on how we can try to have an impact on society toward the driving of a change or a small transformation. So I decided to open this talk with this sort of provocative statement, so how to make sense of design, because in my life, many times I asked myself, okay, I'm a web designer, I'm enough skilled to make motion graphic video website, but how to make sense of what I'm doing is instead of making the usual website for corporation or for companies, how to make sense and make something useful for other people, not only for big companies. So just to start briefly, I would like to introduce myself. Somebody tells me I'm a programmer because I have some skills in programming or a designer, sometimes journalist, but in reality, I like to define myself an hybrid. Hybrid, it's a mess, as you can imagine, because just a, a brief about my education. So I, I made this visualization several years ago on my personal website with the idea of showing how many different things, not only programming or web design, but even motion graphic, traveling, playing instruments, playing theater, and here there is the time. And the idea, it's very qualitative because I cannot measure how much time I spend in making theater or playing music. I try to approximate. Here is the time I dedicate to all the things, and as you can imagine, actually my life, it's basically a very focus on, on the design. Before was more on creative coding, play music, traveling. But the three main things, the, probably the most important, are web design that I started since, since the beginning, since the HTML1 with tables, then all this history, so moving to, to Flash, and then the end of Flash, actually the web 2.0. Obviously, data visualization, it's almost new. I started in 2010 in uh, uh, exploring the possibility given by data visualization. And obviously, programming, uh, I have a sort of love and hate relation with programming because I love programming, but sometimes it's really struggling because you don't know why the things are not working because I, in the end, I'm not a real programmer. I have some background. So it's always really stressing, but sometimes it's really enjoying because it's like making something magic sometimes. And then all these three things uh, converged in this new field that we call visual journalism. It's not a new keyword, but what we did in a way, not only me, but also Chris Kreuz, that is a colleague of mine, in these three years we decided to with our students to explore the, the possibility given by data visualization. And we try to tell local stories uh, in, a, in a visual way. But this is the, sorry, the URL is visualjournalism.unibz.it. It's a platform where we collected all the works students made in these years. I will show you something later. But since the beginning, we understood that alone we cannot move so far. So we started collaborating with journalists, so creating the first uh, interdisciplinary experiences between designer and a journalist, because journalists are very good in telling all the context, providing facts and data, while the designer were very good in packing all these things in a user experience or a design experience. But then, personally, I am very skeptic on this data issue because probably now it's sort of dogma that data don't lie, big data and so on. But in reality, especially when we, we talk about social things or reality, statistical data, so numbers, uh, are just a small part of the story. Sometimes tells, people tell data don't lie, but probably it's one of the biggest fake news in the history. For instance, there's a nice book, it's called uh, Lying with Statistics. It, it was written in the 54. It has the age of my father, more or less. So since then, uh, 
line with statistics, so using data to tell what you would like to tell, it's very easy. It's more easier than in other way. So I would reframe it mentioning Salvatore Iaconesi. Probably you don't know Salvatore, but it's a, if you have the chance, just browse Salvatore Iaconesi on internet. He gave a nice TEDx talk. And Salvatore used to say that data is an opinion. So for instance, if we put a sensor in this room in order to measure the amount of light, we receive a certain value if we put the sensor here, while if we put the sensor down there, probably the value is different. So data don't lie. Probably yes, but what is lying is the way data were sampled. Okay. And I have some example later if you want to explore more this provocatory statement. Anyway, data is the best way to lie. So in order to uh, provide a more complete experience and depiction of the reality, we decided also to collaborate with social scientists because I will explain a little bit later. For instance, we made a project about the Chinese people living in Bolzano. What tells the data about Chinese people? The Chinese people are just the 0.6% of the world population. So there's no invasion as the mainstream media were telling. But the 0.6% tell, ju tell just one thing. Chinese are not invading the city, but for instance, this number is not telling how much Chinese are integrated, how much they speak well Italian or not. So this is the contribution, for instance, of social scientists that contribute telling what data can say, something that sometimes is more powerful than the, the numbers. So we rely on this idea that the truth doesn't exist. Probably there are several approximation of the reality. As designer, we can try to return as many facets as possible of the complexity of reality. Sometimes it's a very ugly experience, so we can try as designer try to report something in a more appropriate way, but it's not easy. So what we try to do, again, is to return the complexity of, of the world, of the social phenomenon, to a broader audience in a more engaging and approachable way. With the idea of empowering readers to understand the complexity through the provision of multiple entry points. So a single story can be told using data, the numbers, using uh, interviews made by anthropologists uh, through uh, data visualization or through text. So there are many ways to tell the same thing in order that everybody can find a, a, an entry point that fits his or her own interest. Long story short, then we decided in a certain moment to reframe our, let's say, keyword. So because sometimes we made project without journalists, but with only with social scientists. So we decided to reframe everything and calling it informative experiences. Because I will show you later, not only we, we, we designed some projects that, that take place in the space, so not only in, in the digital space, in the physical space. So as they provide a, a real experience. So, but just to explain a little bit what is an informative experience, you can imagine information, it's something that is not direct, it's indirect. Information is written by somebody, is told by somebody that is not you. While the experience is something that it's direct, you experience something. So informative experience, in a way, is something that tries to reduce this distance toward the returning, or better, I read it, uh, that intends to let the reader experience what the information is driving. I show you some example. The next example are uh, works made by our students and are very different. For instance, this one, it's called psychosis and lentique, I don't know how to translate, lentils, thank you. That was, the, it was a, a real title of a newspaper. What is this project about? After the Paris attack, the terrorist attack in the Bataclan, it happened something very strange in the worldwide media, especially in Europe, especially in Italy. Many object that was left in the train station, in the park, because probably people forgot after the, ter the terrorist attack were uh, intended as possible bombs. 
So people was under a sort of psychosis where every object left in the public space was a possible potential uh, object, da dangerous object. So what happened later? Every object was in a way isolated by the police, make this object explode, and probably people understood, ah, okay, it was just a, a can of uh, beans. Or other things like valigia lenticchie, so it's like uh, wallet and lentils, vibrating umbrella. These are real titles that appear on, on the newspaper. And in one week, we registered, the, the original work was made by a journalist, so the journalist registered 2,000 fake bomb news because especially on the, on the local newspaper, all these news are very frequent due to the sensationalism that local media usually used in order to attract readers. So if you search uh, alarm bomba, so fake alarm um, on Google in that week, we collected more than 2,000 news that obviously there's no bomb in Italy. But as soon as you enter in this space, because the idea was to spread this experience, not on, in the digital space, but in the public space. As soon as you enter, all these white stripes contains all, every single title, 2000. In the center, you find the table with the main, uh, mis, uh, mis, how to say, the, the main object that was depicted as potential object of terror. So people can explore, and the idea was to let people reflect on how much we are manipulated by the media because after a terrorist attack, uh, the media supported the, the spread of this psychosis where everything, even a small uh, can that will, contains uh, tuna, for instance, was, uh, I'll say, um, denounced to the police and so on. And there are some news that are really amazing. I don't know, this was a fake bomb with Arab writing on that because was a, how to translate in English, boa, these floating elements in the sea. Eh? Boy. Boy, okay, was a boy probably from, I don't know from, uh, from where, but was found in the city, so you can imagine the panic that this object created. And this is just, so the aim was also to affect people that are not on digital media, so old people, for instance, and so on. Another project, it's called Eldorado. I think it's also online. The website, it's, the URL, it's eldorado.com. Again, the idea was to raise awareness on the number of migrants in Italy because there is a research from Ipsos, Ipsos Mori that is 2014, revealed that Italian people think the migrants in Italy are close to the 35% of the poor population while in the reality it's the 7.8 or 8.1. So very few compared to the perception. So we have a perception problem. So the students made this informative capsule that in a way are a sort of infographics because they contain metaphorical objects that are connected to the topic they drive. But the, the strategy was to spread the capsule, these capsules uh, in the uh, shops of the city. So for instance, you go to the bakery shop and you find the one with, with the coins or the one with the stones. The one with the stones is about, for instance, the, how many migrants work in the agriculture in Italy. And it's a lot because the golden represents the, the migrants, the white stones represents the Italian. Because the idea is, first of all, not to stereotyping people because they are black. But uh, because the, the name of the project is Eldorado, because we are perceived by them as the Eldorado land, so where you can find money and, and become rich. But on the other side, migrants are, are our Eldorado in a way, especially if you think on, on the agriculture. So in the moment, we just send them to their own country of origin, probably our agriculture will die in a second. So every object will drive a different information. The one with the rice, probably, okay, this is the agriculture. And then there is here a sort of explanation and QR code that redirects you to the source where the information came from. Again, the idea was to affect people that usually are online and maybe when they read something about migrants or especially news that contradicts 
their position. So probably a news that tells migrants are not enough, not enough as you can imagine. This kind of people usually just uh, swipe or close the page. In this way, you are attracted not by the, by the news, by the information, but by the object that it's in a way very elegant. And then the idea is to put a sort of, uh, yes, a uh, not pulcinello orecchio. I don't know how to translate pulcinello orecchio now. <laughs> Please <laughs> translate. So to, pro to give you a hint that probably you are not so right. Ah, sorry, the one with the, with the coins was about the GDP. And even here, the, the coins are gold-plated. The agriculture, uh, this one was about not the GDP, but the pensions. So how much migrants contribute to the pensions? This one was about how many migrants are Christian. Because another fake news is that all the migrants arrive in Italy in order to spread their Muslim religion. But in reality, the majority of migrants are Catholic. So this was another project. And here a close up of the, this one was probably the most interesting, it was about the world population. So the famous 8.3%. Talking about infographics, the idea is to have a sort of, uh, let, let's say, spurious infographics, because in a normal infographics or a chart, you should have this 8.3 and on the other side, the Italian people. But we decided to have a more uh, engaging thing and also, Probably in this way, you don't perceive the whole amount of migrants because migrants are in a way spread in the society. So uh, it seems few to me. To other people, we got some feedback. Other people tell, told us anyway that you are too much. But probably you cannot change the mind of these people with, uh, with rice. Another project, it's called Chernobyl. Again, was in order, a project that aims to raise awareness on the fake news and especially on the responsibility we as uh, Facebook users, for instance, in sharing fake news. So it's a game where the screen is split for, in four parts. So it's a game for four players. Every player is provided with a news that could be uh, true or fake. And they have just one button, so they have to choose to share or not to share. In the moment they share a good news, a true news, nothing happens. When, once they share a fake news, a sort of um, stinky cloud, it's spread in the air with this metaphorical idea that when you spread or share a fake news, you are intoxicating not only you, but also people that follow you, people around you. And was very <laughs> stinky this cloud so and this was a project made with Arduino with the idea of uh, engaging young people and also not only young because later after one year there was um, a, a work from the Pew Research Center that demonstrated that the major responsible for spreading fake news are the old people not the young people anyway we weren't aware of that in, in the moment. But talking about methodology behind this kind of work, we usually work with interdisciplinary teams, as I told before. So working with journalists, social scientists, and diverse kind of people. We rely on co-design approach. Co-design, it's a, a shortcut to tell collaborative design. So it means that everybody contribute to the design of the thing with his own, her own contribution toward a, of a returning a, a more complex object. And obviously, we rely on the so-called user-centered design. So we focus on which is the person we want to affect, which is our target user, who is. And then around him or her, uh, we build all the, the project with the idea, again, to provide multiple entry points. And again, sorry to tell complex phenomena to a broader audience and return the complexity in a more approachable way. Yes, uh, yes, because there's a, this is is not a quotation from this book, but it's in a way it's connected. If you have the chance, give uh, read this book. It's called Information Diet. It's really nice. He make the author make this metaphor between the fake news and the junk food. So, as we learned 
maybe in years to educate ourselves, understanding that junk food is not healthy as it's supposed to be, but it's just toxic in a way. Junk news or fake news that he call junk news are news that are written in order to entertain, to make us click, to generate an income for the platform, but not really to inform. So we should, in a way, we educated ourselves with, with the food, we should re-educate ourselves in reading, try to read only uh, things that are written in order to inform us. Because not a more informed, because we are already over informed, but probably a better informed society, it's a more healthy in this idea that if we are what we eat, we also are what we read. And then I will just give you some theoretical uh, reference for the theory. Okay. So what is social design? Because I decided to open with this uh, keyword that is not social design, but it's social design. I try to summarize the differences. Social design refers, or better, it's rooted to the social works. It's, it's usually used to uh, refer to this kind of design activity that in a way involve people that outside the market, like people with disabilities, people with problems, or I don't know, people that is just out of the market. Making objects that sometimes are normal objects. So once you look at the object, you don't get if it's made by people with disability or a company, a normal company. While social design, share a socio-political attitude, first of all, that aims to transform, to produce, to have an impact. It's not made by people with disabilities, or could be, but it's not the, the, the core. The core is that uh, he aims, the, 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 it aims to, to opening debate, supporting uh, activists, trying to drive a change. So while the social design, the goal is to include people, social design, the aim is to transform, just to summarize. Obviously, reality is more complex. There are projects I will show you later that probably include people and then try to transform through the object. Just to make an example, this is from a collection that is called Social Design. So are just normal objects, but are made by people with disabilities. But in the moment you look at the object, you don't get where the object came from, how it was made. But yes, this is a classical example of social design. Even Manzini, do you know Manzini, the name? Yes. Okay, silence, okay. <laughs> Try to create a distinction between, between these two kind of design, socially oriented design. This one, for instance, it's a project that it's fully in this idea of social design. Um, it's a series of houses for children made by migrants in uh, Treviso. The name is uh, Rifugiati, because in Italian, Rifugiati, Rifugiati are two different words, even if it's just a matter of switching the accent. But refugiati means repair yourself, so referring to the children. Refugiati means asylum seeker or refugees. The idea is to, it came from um, Fabrizio Rettini, a designer in Treviso, that he decided to work with migrants, establishing a carpentry, a wood workshop, and they started building these houses. But what is interesting is not the houses itself, but the process behind. Because usually in Italy, uh, migrants prefer to stay in their migrant center. It's a sort of comf comfort zone, but it's not really useful because citizens look at them browsing the internet on their mobile phone. So the main stereotype is that we are paying money with our taxes to these people that are just stealing our Wi-Fi, stealing everything, and they are just there without contributing or working in the society. So the first aim once the, he approached this group of people was, okay, now you go to the shops and buy some nails. Now you go to the shop and buy some paint. And the migrants say to him, sorry, but I'm not able to speak Italian. Ah, it's your own problem. You should learn Italian. This is the first thing in order to be accepted in the society. So making these houses in a way was a, a way to push migrants to exit from the comfort zone, leave this comfort zone, and learning a little bit of Italian. On the same time, the same reaction happened to the shop owner, when the shop owner sees five black people entering in, in his shop, and at Treviso, it's a very tough city because it's basically property of the 
Lega North, so it's a sort of right-wing municipality. So you can imagine the man in the, uh, in the shop sees five African people entering, probably if, 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 we, if he would have a, a gun, probably he was handling the gun. And the first time was quite dramatic, but in the end, after the fifth, the sixth time, even the, the local citizen understood they are normal people, they are just here to buy your uh, screws and nails and hammer, and that's it. So this idea ha allows to reduce the tension between us and them, deconstructing in a way some invisible walls that too often separate the communities in the city. And then the same story once it's the time to, um, to, 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 to ship these houses. So if the, the houses were sold in the, the city of Treviso, the makers has to bring manually directly to the family who bought the houses again to make them discover the city and to make people stuck in the traffic discover that there are other people that live in the city. Another incredible social design, it's called Lampedusa Cruises, was made by Theon Castellin, that is a contemporary artist in Amsterdam, because in Amsterdam there are many boats that offer canal tour to discover the city. What he was able to do was to bring this boat that landed in Lampedusa in 2013, bring to uh, the Netherlands and restore in order that now can ship, the, can ship the, the canal because you must be electrical powered. And it's interesting because this boat works exactly as the other touristic boat. So the boat, the service offers touristic tour in the city, but who is telling the story of the city are not touristic guide, but Syrian migrants that are telling the story of the city of Amsterdam, but with a special focus on the contribution that migrants have had in the development of the city. And again, the impact is double. One time the participants are super immersed because they are physically immersed in the water in a boat of the classical uh, migrants boat with migrants telling story of migrants at the same time, even people that are outside, so looking at the, at the canal or on other normal boat, see this Im Im image here that it's quite strange. So in this way, it impacts in the society. Obviously, you cannot, we cannot measure this kind of impact, but obviously, it starts leading and uh, working in your mind and makes you reflect. This kind of project are made are collected in a platform that I decided to publish one year ago that is called designformigration.com. As the text says, it's a repository for design project that deals with migration issue. With this idea of collecting, even design for migration could be in a way think of it as a social design project because the idea is to, first of all, connect people, connect designer that works on the same topic and they don't know each other. That is very common, especially in Italy. The, the second thing is to inspire a public of designer that wants to find new ways and tell, support muni uh, institution, uh, social operator, municipality, major, showing them that there are other possibility to involve and make activities in order, again, to create a more inclusive society. But let's say this social thing is not really new. Probably one of the first contributor of everything. Ah, wow, uh, there's, I'll show you an error later. Otto no who knows Otto Neurath? Okay, only the Austrian people, no. Was an Austrian economist, philosopher, sociologist that after the first world war, he had this dream of educating people visually. Why? Because after the First World War, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was basically reduced to the 10%. And there, wa there was a lot of people in poor condition, completely uneducated. So it was impossible to re um, educate them in a more traditional way. So he invented this visual system that he called isotype. Sorry, is not originally should be written isotype. Anyway, you can imagine. And this is the meaning of isotype, International System of Typographic Picture Education. Here's some example. So what he did was just uh, 
reimagining because 50 years before, so in the end of 800, um, the data visualization was invented. So what he did after 50 years was rethinking the way data visualization was created and replacing abstract rectangles or bars with pictograms. And, but very important was the, for probably the first one, they decided to work with the interdisciplinary team. So he worked with designer, with economist, expert. For instance, this is about the world imperium. So this is the world pop worldwide population, then the Chinese empire and the Roman empire. So basically, sorry. He took the previous experience on data visualization that were, there were more to, toward the analysis of the data and he just gave this turn into a more informative practice. He introduced this interdisciplinary approach and also the role of the transformer that is very important was the role that he just left for himself. Basically the transformer was probably the, the design of today. Somebody that is expert in the visual and also in the case of Neurath in the verbal language in order to adapt the, the visual and verbal language to the target user. So in this way, he was able also to, I guess, this is the work of his wife because he died in the 45 and this was made later. By the way, even the wife was involved in this uh, team. Our project made for the government of Nigeria, I guess in the 58, if I'm not wrong. So how to vote? using visual storytelling, basically. Obviously, we also had in, let's say, modern times, design in Italy, in Italy designer as Massimo Dolcini, they worked a lot in this, using graphic design to drive a change. So, sorry, I, I repeat this one. It's every citizen has a place in the district or in the city council. This one is resist for the peace against the terrorism. So he made this graphic poster that were very strong. He called uh, Grafica di Pubblica Utilità, Public Utility Graphic. He was a pupil of Albert Steiner that probably Albert should be before. Anyway, even Albert Steiner is one of the greatest designers we had in Italy that used design to try to drive a change. So it's peace, it's quite easy and understandable. If 25th of April, so liberation from the fascism, or this was for a museum on deportation. But yes, how to make these things? So I, pro I provided here two examples of projects that I did, not with students, but as a part of my research, that are very different. This one, it's called Technically speaking, it's called participatory data physicalization. Then I will explain step by step. Basically, it was an experience to inform people on a very tough topic as the cancer is. Because probably you, you already experienced that. When you read something about cancer, and maybe you are smoking a cigarette or you are drinking alcohol, and maybe what you, you are reading is telling exactly that if you drink or smoke, you are subject to get a cancer very probably. Often people just flip the page. I don't want to read something that tells I'm going to die because there is still this stereotype that cancer is connected to death. Sometimes it's true, other times it's not true because the research is really increasing and improving. So many, many person every year recover from a cancer. So we were asked by this startup to create an experience that trigger a re an information request by the participant. So we are not informed directly, but we want that people ask us for information. So we came up with this strange concept that I will explain step by step. So probably you know what is a data visualization. Data physicalization, it's very similar. So data, instead of being visualized, are physicalized and take place in the public space. For instance, this is the map of the London crimes. So instead of having a map with bubbles, it's something made of cardboard. You can walk around, you can even smell. There are many things that are activated compared to a, to a traditional digital experience. 
and you learn through the body, through the experience, not only through the eyes. That obviously the eyes are part of your body, but are different. This one is about the eviction in the United States. So you can also, you, here you see the, the, the proportion, so it's very big. This is the so-called data physicalization. But then we introduced a participatory approach. Participatory means that people contribute with their own ideas. So in the beginning, like in this case, this was probably the first ex experience of participatory data physicalization. Uh, took place in the 70s in the MoMA, where the German artist Hans Hacke challenged the, the visitor, asking themselves if they would vote the Senator Nixon for president. And Nixon was also in the board of MoMA. And after, I think, um, he decided to ban the artist from the MoMA for I don't know how many years. What happened is, is just a normal ballot box, but are transparent. So you have a real-time feedback of the opinion of the people. Obviously, if people don't participate, nothing takes place, nothing exists. So participatory means that in the end, it's like a chart, a bar chart, where you see yes or no. Or this is another interesting project made by Domestic Data Streamers, a group that came from Barcelona. The topic was very tough. They asked all the participants to, they gave each person a balloon and told the, every person, just measure the cord of the balloon according to the age you would like to die. Oh, okay. So I think black is for men, white is for women, I'm not sure. Anyway, once you enter in this room, it's very poetic in a way because you are presenting in this environment made of balloon that represents something different. This one, oh sorry, it's, it's too much up uh, on the top. Anyway, was the Swiss Pavilion in 2015 in Milan. They decided to make an experiment. Instead of showing the traditional Swiss product, they asked visitors if we have enough food for everybody. Because the idea, they have an estimate of the global visitors of the whole event. And they decided to provide the same or the right amount of food for every person. And people, and they created these transparent silos. Sorry, make me just adjust this slide so you can, I don't know why, move it here. Okay, now it's better. Again, one, a two, okay. These trans transparent silos was, people can enter freely and can take food for free. So the challenge was, if you visitors behave in a very uh, fair way, so you pick the food only for yourself, probably there will be enough food for everybody. What happened in the reality? After three months, and not one year, so the expected ending, after three months, these that uh, work as a sort of bar chart, they finish the food in three months, demonstrating that the human, or at least the, the the behavior of visitors is not really sustainable. So I think, and I'm very passionate with participatory data physicalization because it opened new space to design, to engage, to interact, and obviously to inform. But very interesting for me is that blurs the boundary between the traditional design disciplines. So we can design a product, but it's also part of a sort of exhibition because it takes place in the public space, but also inform and also, yes, probably interact, people interact with it. So even interaction design, we should add. Obviously, yes, give away way to artifact that disposes it for participation. And very important, turns visitor into participant. So compared to a traditional informative process, finally, we are part of the information that we are not just receivers. For this reason, sometimes or we, we evaluated that works very well in forming people for this activation of the user. So finally, we decided to make this project that took place in 2017 at the TEDMED in Politecnico di Milano on the cancer prevention information because cancer is connected to that. And it one, one is one of the issue with the highest rate of information avoidance. So when people decide to not to read. One reason is because usually this kind of top-down information, medical, scientific information, 
let feel the people in a way guilty because you know you shouldn't drink, you shouldn't smoke, and so on. So how to design a, a, or how to trigger a bottom-up information request. So we made, finally we explained what is this first part. Now let me just briefly explain what is the you draw it approach. The first time I saw you draw it was on the New York Times, you draw it. It was a series of um, projects, obviously, articles that ask to the visit to the, to the readers. For instance, this one is about the Obama administration compared to the previous, the Bush administration. They asked the visitor, okay, uh, what do you think about the unemployment rate? I say, okay, with Obama maybe it was the same, but once you guess on numbers, then you want to discover if you were wrong or right. So it aroused curiosity. I don't know now, it's about national spending on healthcare. So I said, maybe with Obama, the healthcare was increasing because due to the Obamacare, no. The national debt, probably yes, with Obama was the same. And then you discover, ah, wow. It's a continuous surprising experience because it challenges you. It pushes you to confront with things that you usually never reflected on. For instance, on, on the Mexican people deportation, I thought with Obama were less instead of were more. But the most powerful part of this process is not only when you reflect on something for the first time, but once you decide to um, draw your chart, it's to discover what's the, the right answer. And another interesting part is that New Times is collecting this data. So it's collecting the, uh, the ignorance rate of their of the readers, basically. So we decided to combine this approach. And we asked people to guess on data. Uh, related to the cancer. So pushing them to confront probably for the first time on some numbers and instilling a doubt about their knowledge and very important, pushing us, pushing them to ask for an information. So again, uh, this experience was made by a series of questions like, do you drink alcohol? Yes, no, very easy. The first six were very easy in order to engage people and not just shock them. People usually are very honest because they are in a sort of, like, it's like being on the stage because you are in the public space, there's an audience looking, looking at you, so you feel a little bit under pressure. People avoid to quit compared to the digital um, form where sometimes you read something or you understood it takes too much time and you quit. Once people arrived in the, uh, in the half, like this woman, we started with the most tough question. So how, much, how many Italians in a year recover from a cancer? Oh, wow, I never asked this to myself and I want to know. And what happened often, people uh, don't know that the answer, but just look at the majority and then answer it as the majority was answering, that it was wrong. But what is important in the end, people ask it as, okay, but how many Italians in a year recover from a cancer? And we provided them this booklet, so providing the right answer. After a one day, 150 person participated and 150 person asked for this information. I cannot swear how many of them now are really aware of everything, but obviously for the first time we tried to provide a, a small change in people's mind. Uh, and also, that was really painful. We spent another four hours to remove all the wires and registering all the choices people made in a digital way because this is one of the biggest problems of making the things physical and then you need this digital data. But it's another part of the story. Last project, because I guess we are, we are on time, Sylvia, or, okay. The one I was telling you before, it's quite old, it's from 2015. It's called People's Republic of Bolzano, that it's a, an ironic title. And it's a website. The website, it's P, the URL, it's peoplesrepublicofbolzano.com, the English version. Otherwise, there is the Italian and German version that it's Repubblica Popolare di Bolzano.it. Because in Bolzano, this town where I'm living since seven years ago, since it's close to the Austrian border, people speak Italian or German. They are mixed. And that year, people were very uh, concerned about this 
Chinese invasion because uh, they, even when you walk in the street or in the bar, you don't see Chinese. I, I, came, I was born in Milan. I know there is a Chinatown here. It's very big. It's from the, I guess, 1910. But we also had some news stating there's a Chinatown in Bolzano, is in Claudia Augusta Street, and so on. So we made this project. But the first thing we made was, OK, let's look at the famous data, what data says. How many people came from China live in Bolzano? And the answer is 633 over 100. And uh, 5,000 citizens. So it means the 0 0.6. This number would be enough just to debunk any kind of distorted perception. But there is a problem because with numbers you cannot change the idea of the people because people were still cons convinced that they were invaded by Chinese. So we look at the business data. So how many shops? Chinese run shops open in, in, the, in the last, uh, yes, from the 97. And was very interesting discovering that despite the population of Chinese was more or less the same, uh, the city registered an increase of Chinese shops opening up to 19 in a year in 2010. That probably for a small city like Bolzano, it's, it's a lot. But why? Because in a certain moment they started buying all the restaurants that were selling their, uh, the license. And then they started differentiating the business, their business. So hair dryer, massage center, apparel store, and so on. So they opened new shops. But yes, talking about invasion, it's always strong. And then we decided to check what online media, local media, obviously, were saying. Now I'm going to translate the title because uh, Chinese break, break uh, battles in the middle of the rails. I think it, it is not a real great news, by the way. And then he was brought to the psychiatrist. Or Chinese bar close to 150. This was the first time the Chinatown keyword appeared. So the Chinatown of Bolzano is in Claudia Augusta Street. Or even the Dolores bar, now it's owned by Chinese. That it's not a news, I don't know. But probably because it's an historical bar, but again, it, it's not really straight, straight the way they addressed this issue, but they contributed in creating a sort of feeling of invasion. This is one of the best. The first, mega, the first Chinese mega store that challenged the, the local shop, it's in Via Torino, and if you go, in Via Torino, you discover this is the Chinese megastore. Because you use the keyword, as, as a journalist, you have a responsibility in what you write. You should use the proper word. This is a shop, it's not a megastore. Anyway, the local traders, too many permission given to the Chinese shop owner. But then when you read the article, you discover they are completely fine with Chinese people, are just the title that are very aggressive. And as you may know, People just read the title, not the articles. Then another statement from the vice president of the Traders' Union. It will be a massacre for our bar, pizzeria, and for the whole um, restaurant sector in general. And then Lega North, let's stop the Chinese advance. And this one is my favorite. Among the most diffuse surnames in Bolzano, we have the Chinese Chen. <laughs> And then you read the article, then you discover the, this kind of surname. It's close to the 38th place in the ranking. So there are many other surnames before. And before the Chinese Chen, we have the Italian uh, Gigliotti, that is from Calabria. Uh, so probably we should speak before of a Calabria invasion, so people from the south. Anyway, it's very curious that Chinese Chen was close to the 40 in the ranking, but the title was about, hey, look. So I think we collected more than 200 um, titles in three years, so it was a lot. And probably this contributed a lot to, to create this feeling. Obviously, local media share usually this sensationalist approach because they have to, to shock, they have, because probably in the, in the province nothing happens, so you have to, in a way, give a, a little bit of spice to your news. 
Another factor is that Chinese people often, by cultural tradition, prefer to work in the public space because they are mainly entrepreneur and not employee, at least in Italy, because you earn more money as an as a, as entrepreneur. And then are very easy to spot, even if they are Italian. For instance, you are a second generation or you are from Korea or from Thailand or you are adopted, but in the, on the average, you are always spotted as Chinese. So I think these are other factors that contributed to this idea that Chinese are everywhere. Now, as close, but until last year, if you get off the train in Bolzano, you just meet the first of a series of kiosk that are selling, uh, let's say, South Tyrolean food, or food that it's in a way identified with South Tyrolean, because the, probably the, uh, the kebab, it's Turkish, it's not South Tyrolean, but obviously it's connected to the German, but probably the Weisswurst, all this kind of Wurstel. And when you get off the train station, you, you have, like, I think, four or five of this kind of kiosk. But the first one was owned by this guy, Yangui Chen that also took part in the project. I asked him why you are cooking Wurstel and not, for instance, Chinese food. He told me, sorry, I grew up here. I arrived, I was three, and, and now I'm feeling more Italian than Chinese, and I love South Tyrolean food. So why I should cook Chinese if my, I love, I love uh, South Tyrolean food? So for me, this was a matter of integration. But at the same time, it could be seen as, as a matter of invasion because Sorry. <laughs> Even our traditional food now, it's made by Chinese. So they stole also our traditional food, and it's a problem. So every, everything can has at least two sides, and we should be aware of that. So we decided to make this website starting from the, from the beginning. So the story is told through a series of, let's say, slides. Every slide takes the space of the browser. We call them informative. Uh, unit because as you may know you don't read from top to bottom when you read a, a website you just scroll until you find something that affects you and uh, arouses curiosity then you decided to read and maybe if it's interesting probably you move back or again you continue to scroll and randomly for this reason we created these small uh, slides where every slide contain a sort of small information that stands for itself Obviously, if you read from top to bottom, you have the whole story. This one is the first one that tells that the first Chinese in Italy arrived in the end of 800, not last year. Or again, from the global, we decided to move to the national. For instance, con connecting the city of Bolzano, where the Chinese are the 0 0.6, with the average in Italy, that it's three times more. And then revealing that even now, the majority of Chinese living in Italy came from a small region that is called Zhejiang, that it's big like this, so it's like the Lombardia, but it has the same population of the, of the Italy. It's about four, 54 million of inhabitants, while Italy has 60 million. But then, because data can lie, we also made this nice interview, I show you uh, just a couple, where every person, we try to give a different depiction of the traditional Chinese perception. So, for instance, this is the guy of the Wurstel, and every person tries to uh, dismantle a cliche on the Chinese culture and tradition. And Yang Gui is talking about the westernization of his parents, thanks to him, because their parents were very uneducated and arrived here in the 70s, but now, He's able to speak three languages, he's very South Tyrolean, and he says, my parents now are more uh, Western, thanks to me. Sorry, okay, let me see if the audio works. Arrivo a casa, okay. valigia, entro dentro al ristorante, avevo il piercing che non avevano ancora visto, avevo il, uh, i colori completamente tinti, ma non uh, tipo come adesso il... Uh, cioè, da una parte di un colore e dall'altra dell'altro. Erano proprio tu, tu, completamente biondi. Che anch'io quando mi guardavo allo specchio dicevo, ma quello sono davvero io. Sono entrato dentro, non ho detto niente, mi sono fermato lì al, alla porta, al portone all'ingresso. Cioè, appena entri dentro, dove c'è l'atri, dove tutti mangiano, 
arriva mia madre, mi riceve, io mi aspettavo, che le so, insulti, cose così. Lei con lo sguardo basso, perché questa è una differenza con l'Occidente, i, i cinesi tendono molto di meno a guardarti negli occhi, è una cosa che proprio non è per rispetto, è proprio per abitudine, tendono molto di più a guardarti per il complesso. Quindi non mi ha guardato negli occhi, non mi ha guardato bene alla faccia, mi stava guardando, poi mia madre è bassa, poverina. <ride> Dopo un 5-6 secondi mi vede, alza lo sguardo, mi fa, oddio, ma, ma sei te? <ride> ha chiamato mio padre per il nome e gli fa, oh, guarda tuo figlio come è diventato. <ride> mio padre si gira e mi aspettavo delle, de, delle gran botte, invece mi guarda, si è messo a ridere, tipo... C'erano altri suoi due o tre amici lì, mi, mi hanno deriso, proprio, non una risata un po', sai, nascosta, proprio spudoratamente in faccia, ha, 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 appunto, con tanto di, di, di dito puntato. È stata una reazione molto sorprendente, perché mi aspettavo invece una reazione un po' più brusca. Io penso che i miei genitori si siano occidentalizzati, soprattutto a causa mia, perché avendo un figlio, tra virgolette, quasi più italiano che cinese in casa tutti i giorni, tutti i mesi, tutto l'anno, non può che avere delle ripercussioni su anche il tu quello che è il tuo ruolo da genitore. Ok. The most common feedback after this video was Hey, but he speaks very well Italian. So people don't care about what he's saying about the westernization of their parents, of his parents, but how well he speaks Italian. So it's a fact. It's a, it's a fact that Some kind of person doesn't trust the number or just don't consider the numbers, but are very sensitive to videos, to something that seems more real than the numbers. And sometimes it's not about the content of the video, but ju just a small detail. But this detail is very important because put people in front of their stereotypes. So probably you just go to the Chinese restaurant and you speak with a single person and that is Chinese and maybe he's not able to speak very well Italian because he's just arrived. And according to you, this is the Chinese. All the Chinese, it's like this person. But then finally, through a website, you have an occasion to, to, to meet somebody different and to talk, not talk with him, but listening to him. So the website, in a way, this project creates a sort of chance to, to meet each other. This is another edited video we made because after this serious interview that took one hour and since the interview were made by an anthropologist and not by, an, by a journalist, it means that the, the method was the anthropological method. So usually three days of meeting, so three meetings before the interview in order to get their trust because they are very intimate. Some of these interviews are very intimate. And then Every interview took one hour, one hour of talks, in order to make five minutes. After this hour, they were very exhausted. And in that moment, where their defenses were very low, <laughs> but we, we talked with them before, we made some really tough question, the classic question that every person, in a, on the average, in a bar, wants to ask to Chinese, if it's true that you, will, you eat cats and dogs and so on. They, They play with it, and this is a short edit we made for in the website. <laughs> in Chinese, non muoiono mai. <laughs> ho imparato la R. Il primo anno in cui ho vissuto qua, voi italiani sì, mi sembravate tutti dannatamente uguali. I cinesi pensano solo ai soldi, e se pagano per comprare il bar, lo, lo pa pagano con la banca perché con la valle di getta di soldi pot potrebbero venire rubati da chiunque. Vedevo gli altri arricciare la lingua, la arricciavo anch'io, magari all'inizio sputacchiavo un po'. E ho imparato la R con il gargarismo. Leggendo i, i libri e praticando tantissime volte così ci sono riuscita a praticare, cioè a dire R. Sì, tra i cinesi ci si può baciare, <ride> assolutamente. Ah, in pubblico <ride> no. È vietato, diciamo, adesso di più. Si dà, una, si dà la mano, si saluta appunto e basta, non si danno i bacini. <ride> Qua in Italia è permesso sbaciucchiarsi in pubblico, e anche se è una cosa che io tendo a evitare per preferenze mie personali. 
Adesso sì, adesso si può baciare in pubblico in Cina, è molto aperto in Cina. E 20 anni fa forse deve nascondere qualche parte e baciarsi, sì. Io no, però a certa zona della Cina si mangia. C'è anche la festa dei, 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 dei cani, che si mangiano solo cani. Bon, lì è... Uh, sì, in alcune zone ma cioè, i cinesi mangiano gatti, anche, cioè, anche i cani. Io non ho mai mangiato un gatto o un cane. No, non mangio cani. Non conosco nessuno che abbia mangiato cani. Quando si avvicina il momento in cui si sentono che forse muoiono, o ritornano in Cina, oppure quando muoiono il loro corpo viene lo stesso mandato in Cina. Quando albero quello suo fioli, fioli, eh, eh, foglie, quando cade, eh, cade la sua terra. Ma no? I, cioè, I vivi non usano i documenti dei, dei morti, cioè, questa cosa non ho mai sentito. Questa è una delle storie più strani. I knew when I was at school in Milan that somebody reads an article that tells that Chinese died and then the Chinese community brought this body into the acid in order to recycle the document. It was very funny that she said, I never listened to something similar. So this was a sort of game where for the first time we put the victim of the stereotypes on the stage, debunking the stereotypes. So it's not me or the anthropology that is super expert in Chinese culture telling that you are wrong but are the, 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 the victim of your stereotyping for the first time in a way re-enabling, empowering them. And then we focus on the businesses because how much are, how many are the restaurants or not. It's about the wall activity, just the 1.3% of the wall activity in Bolzano. And out of 441 bar, only 51 are Chinese. And we made this uh, Uh, let's say metaphorical chart that is basically a pie chart but with the aim of using visual metaphor to make more self-standing because even if you are not getting what's the text probably you, you get that it's about bar, Italian bar and Chinese bar even if in the Chinese bar you, they don't serve the traditional tea as in the, in, the, in the picture but in the end the picture serves as a stereotype again so we played in a different way with stereotypes And we made the same also with the restaurants. Um, yeah, it's also true that there's a fact that the 0.6 of the population manage almost the 12% of the restaurants. That is a fact, it's, it's a strong number. Anyway, we are very far from the idea of an invasion. And finally, we made this interactive map where year by year you can understand here there are all the different business activities run by Chinese people and here the places in the city in order to debunk this idea that there's a Chinatown because according to the article this was the Chinatown. Obviously you can filter, you can, and again, reality is double-sided. You debunk that there's no Chinatown but people start telling, look, they are everywhere <laughs> because they are spread uniformly on the, the city because then we had to increase the size of, the, of every dot otherwise it would be very hard, hard to spot. Initially the project was completely ignored by the local media. Pro I don't know, probably because we created a so-called counter-narrative. So we tried to debunk their narrative until we got the attention of Der Spiegel that is a German newspaper that the Italian correspondent of Der Spiegel went in Bolzano three days to document this story and talking about stereotyping, this is a very bad title because he decided to interview Yang Gui and since the, the, the project is called People's Republic and then one time on Facebook I, I, I made the news telling our Ministry of Culture that was referring to the one of the interview. This girl, Chinese girl, was working in the museum as a guide for Chinese tourists. So I made the news on, on the Facebook page of the project telling our Ministry of Culture, because she's part of the Republic, will work as a guide for a Chinese. So once the journalist understood this, told me, okay, now we have to call Yangui Ministry, Ministry of Food. Yes, why not Ministry of 
food or alimentation. And then he made this title, the Ministry of the Wurst, that it's a very, in a way, irritating. But this gave us a lot of push, especially in the local media, because local media, in a way, felt very touched because it was really strange that a German newspaper talks about themselves and they are not on, on the news. So finally, we were able, <laughs> we forced them in a way, not we, because we were, we were very lucky. And thanks to the Der Spiegel, they were forced to, to, to deal with the, with, the, with the reality. So they, they made this ironic title in the end that sounds like, which invasion? Chinese are just the 0 0.6. It's uh, the university is telling that. But in the end, it worked because they also made a, a, a page in their paper, newspaper. But very interesting for us in terms of design research, we made, um, they made an article on Facebook and we started uh, analyzing the quality of the comments, so the sentiment. We analyzed the debate on Facebook and make a comparison with the previous article on Chinese. In the previous one, as you can imagine, the positive comment and the negative comment were almost the same, even the neutral. Are, were, I think 40% I think positive, 40% negative, and 10%, no, 20% 20, 20 neutral. In our case, this article, the positive comment were more than the negative not because we were able to change people's mind. This would be also very scary, in my opinion. But because probably what we observed is that different kind of people took part to the debate. So it was not the same people as before, but probably because the project, in a way, with data and facts, uh, provided a, so a series of argumentation to this thing. And this empowered people in taking part in the debate. Finally, in 2015, the project was awarded with the Data Journalism Award. And it was very funny because I was in Barcelona to, to get this award. I was called by a journalist from the Alto Adige telling me, hey, congratulations, we are very proud that you, you won this prize because we have to say sorry. Some of our colleagues are very bad in dealing with migration issue when they write articles. Uh, I told them, yes, but I, I have to say thank you to you because thanks to your articles, finally, I made a project that won a prize. And she said, yeah, yes, but we should be more aware of our social responsibility as journalists. And it was a really nice interview. Two days after, I came back to my town. I read the interview, and the title is Chinatown of Bolzano. The project was awarded. Again, <laughs> using this Chinatown keyword, probably because the author was not, because in, in, uh, usually in the newspaper, the person who write the title, it's not the person who write the article, because title has a political role. So, but then after this, that was probably the last, uh, la la last shot from them, they in a way reduce, incredibly reduce the amount of article against Chinese. Uh, also because now are no longer the, the enemy Chinese, now the new enemy is the migrants, obviously. So the migrants took the whole space. And, but in the end, this was very powerful. So I finish. So I hope it was useful for you. And thank you.